I to like, I don't know, 10 different churches, not that many, five different churches in a day, <laughs> right? And there's no time to prep a message when you do that. You know, you, you can preach the same one over and over, but then your translator gets bored. You don't want that. <laughs> but, uh, but I've kind of learned, like, I, I just want to follow what the Holy Spirit's doing and saying for a specific meeting at a specific time. And, and as I was praying about today, this, this message about uh, the glory of God and beholding His glory and all that, it was just on my heart. And then all these songs are about glory, and then He says that, and I'm like, this is perfect. This is Jesus giving me a little nudge saying, you got it right, son. You got it. So I'm excited to share this with you. Now, kind of to just let you in on a little secret. Usually, when I share a message, um, I like to share some story from the mission field, some wild, crazy experience I had. And uh, this morning, I was, I was like thinking of all these stories I could tell you. And the Holy Spirit said to me, you know, all those stories you want to tell are because you want them to be impressed with you. Oh. I was like, ah. <laughs> so, <laughs> unless the, the Lord steers me another way, I'm just not going to share that, any of those stories. I'm going to share with you some Jesus stories, and I think this will work out. Yeah. Um, you can watch my YouTube channel if you're really curious about those stories. But um, I'll tell you one of the weirdest stories from the Bible. We'll start there. In Genesis chapter 30, you don't have to look it up, but if, you, if this story is so weird you don't believe it's in there, you can look it up later and find out it's true. In Genesis chapter 30, there's this story of uh, Jacob, who was Abraham's grandson. And he's worked for his uncle, uh, which I know this is weird, but he wanted to marry his cousin, and it's a long story, but that, that, that worked back then. <laughs> and so, but he works for this guy, Laban, uh, for seven years to get the wife he wants, but then the uncle secretly marries him off to his other daughter, and then he works another seven years for the wife that he wanted. So finally, he gets to the end of his commitment, and he says... Uh, he goes to Laban and he says, listen, I'm, I'm out. I've done my work. I'm through. And Laban says, don't go. If you leave, I'm like up a creek without a paddle. He's like, the reason I'm prospering is because you've been watching my sheep. You're doing a great job. Just please keep working for me. Jacob said, you know, Jacob, he's this, he's a crafty guy. He's got ideas, right? And so he says, okay, tell you what, here's what we'll do. I'll take all the speckled spotted sheep and goats, and you can have all the spotless ones. And if you ever find a spotless sheep or goat in my herd, just consider it stolen and take it back. Now, in today's world, that doesn't exactly make a lot of sense, but it's kind of like saying, I'll take the ones and fives and you can have all the $100 bills, right? Like, those were the really valuable sheep that he's giving to Laban, and he's taking the chump change. And Laban's like, that's a sweet deal. Sign me up. I'm in. Now here's where the story gets weird. Jacob goes down to the watering hole, takes these uh, logs, branches of, I think it was poplar if I remember right, and he whittles off these stripes and streaks of the, the bark right off of the wood. And he puts these down as stakes down by the watering hole where the sheep would go to drink and then they would mate there. And what the Bible says, this is in your Bible too, <laughs> When the sheep made it in front of the speckled spotted poles, they gave birth to speckled spotted offspring. Yeah. And then it gets even weirder because Jacob, crafty guy that he is, he only did that when the strong sheep and goats were there, and when the weak ones came, he packed up his poles and walked away. And the Bible says this is how Jacob's flocks grew bigger and stronger than Laban's. Let's close in prayer. <laughs> It's a weird one. What do you do with that, right? Why is that story in the Bible? Well, if you want to do good exegesis, but biblical interpretation, if you want to do it right, the real answer is it is there to tell us why Jacob's flocks grew bigger and stronger than Laban's. But I do find it interesting that there's a principle we can observe here that becomes really obvious later in Scripture. And the principle is you become what you behold. You reproduce what you fix your eyes on. You know, some of you came here expecting a, a meeting where we're going to see healing and miracles, and I guarantee you that is where we're headed, all right? But a lot of what I say today, you're going to be like, what does this have to do with healing and miracles? It has everything to do with it. Here's what often happens in our lives as we go through some really painful experience. There's somebody that maybe you prayed for for years and years and years, and they died of their condition. Or you were believing for, for your own healing, and it's still today, I mean, it's been years and it hasn't happened yet, and here's what happens. 
When we focus on the disappointment, we tend to reproduce disappointment. When you focus on Jesus, you reproduce Jesus. Many of us have allowed ourselves to become disciples of disappointment. And that's what just perpetuates. Proverbs says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Hope deferred, when that thing you're believing for and hoping for is put off and put off and put off, if you're not careful, your heart gets sick. You start to form a theology out of your disappointments, but I would argue that's not theology. Theology is the study of who? Yeah, God, really. Yeah, theos is God in, in that, uh, is that Latin, Greek? That's Greek? Greek. Greek. Yeah, theology. The study of God. Now, what many of us have is what I would call theologyology, which is the study of someone else's study of God. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> That's when you let somebody else pay attention to him and study him and invest their lives in him and tell you, kind of regurgitate to you yes. what they've discovered. Yeah. And you don't have your own study of God, your own theology, your own interaction with him. Yeah. That's not healthy. Another thing we sometimes do is we, we, have a, we develop a theology, we have time we spend with God, and then we reach a point where we draw these lines and we say, I got it figured out, this is God. And I would suggest to you, that's not theology either because you're no longer studying Him. You're studying this little boundary of what you think you figured out. Or what others of us do is we have these disappointments in our lives and we have what I would call disappointmentology, which is the study of our disappointments. We look at all the times it didn't work, all the times it didn't happen, and I'm telling you, there's only one way to live a life that replicates Jesus, and that is to fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Come on. Amen. This is the Jesus I know. And so today, what I want to do is I want to show you what it looks like when you become what you behold in a good way. See, go back to um, uh, Exodus. Uh, I said go back, but we started in Genesis, so we might as well say go ahead <laughs> to Exodus. And when you get into Exodus, uh, is it 33, is when um, Moses is having this, this dialogue with the Lord. He's up on the mountain, and, and he's... You know, the show me your glory, that, that passage. And God's like, no, you can't handle it. If you see my face, you're toast. Literally. You, you will die. It's over. And Moses is insistent. He's like, I can't do this unless you go with me. And God promises him, my, my presence will go with you. The literal Hebrew there is my face will go with you. I mean, it's a, it's a, when Moses says, show me your glory, what's he asking for? He's asking for a visual revelation of God. That he would, with his physical eyes, behold God in all his fullness. Whoa. Yeah. Now God, because Moses is, is insistent, God's like, tell you what, Mo, here's what we're going to do. You tuck yourself into the cleft of this rock, and you hang on for dear life. And I'm going to cover you with my hand, let all my glory pass by you, remove my hand, and let you see the back of me. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm Moses, I'm like, I better do this right. <laughs> right? And so he's tucked in this rock, and God passes by, and then he feels the hand move, he's like, ah! Right? I mean, as far as I can tell, this is the greatest Old Testament revelation of God. Why? Because it's the one time someone almost died looking at it. Right? I mean, every other, like Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up in the trade of his robe filled the temple. Amazing revelation. But he didn't almost die looking at it. This one's wild and crazy. Then you go ahead, uh, you know, wait, well, actually, let's, let's pause for a second here. Let's go back. This time it is back. To the very, very beginning. And God says, let us make man in our image and likeness. If glory is a visual revelation of God, I would suggest to you that we were originally designed to be glorious. Okay? To reveal Him in His fullness, that when people saw us or encountered us, they saw Him. And so what happens is God creates mankind, male and female, in His image and likeness. Right? Then they're hanging out in the garden by the one and only tree that they're told not to eat from. 
I mean, they've got a whole world here. But uh, they're hanging out there by the tree. And of course, we know the story with the serpent coming. Did God really say? And one of the things the serpent says is this. You're not going to die if you eat this fruit. God knows if you eat that fruit, then you'll be like him. So what just happened? The serpent convinced a couple of people who were already in the image and likeness of God that they had to do something else in their own strength to be like God. <laughs> and they bought it. And so they, they eat the fruit. And now the Bible does say they became like God in one way. And that was, you could say they lost the innocence of not even knowing what good and evil were. But at what cost? I mean, as soon as they ate that fruit, shame entered their lives. Is there any shame in God? And so, from that point forward, the image of God in their lives became only skin deep because they were no longer like Him. You see the difference? So you go all throughout this time. You got Moses saying, "Show me your glory." In fact, in the next chapter, Exodus 34, Moses uh, it says would meet with the Lord, and he comes when he came down off the mountain. It says his face was radiant. He spent time talking face to face with the Lord. In fact, the literal Hebrew there is mouth to mouth. That's a big deal. This intimate closeness with God. And he comes down off the mountain glowing. So much so that the Israelites were freaked out. They're like, put a veil over your face, you're scaring us. That's uh, becoming what you behold in a pretty profound way. But apart from even that, it was a, a glory that faded away. And he'd just have to wear the veil until it fully faded. We're getting somewhere. Jesus shows up on the scene. Thousands of years later. And guess what the Bible says? Hebrews 1.3 says the Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. One version says, the express image of the Father. You see, the image of God and the glory of God are very closely linked in Scripture. That's why I started out by pointing out the visual revelation of God. Think about it. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You were designed to reveal God. You were designed to be a person that when people encounter you, they encounter Him. That was the original plan. And so I would suggest to you that, that sin is anything short of the original design. It's that simple. In fact, uh, uh, Romans 14.23 says, uh, anything that does not come from faith is sin. The original design was union with God. It was relationship with Him. It was completely entrusting your life to Him. What He says, I, I believe it, I trust it, I'll live in it. That was the original design. Anything apart from that is sin. We could go into a big list of listing all the things that are bad behaviors, that are sinful sins, right? But at the same time, you can do all kinds of right things but do them apart from faith, apart from trusting in Him, yeah. and it's also sin. That's right. So, I mean, yeah, we can preach against specific sins, but we really, what we're preaching against is independence. Because all those little things, and even all the good things, if it's done in independence, it is sin. If you're depending on God, trusting Him to live His life through you, you don't do all those things. And when you do these things, they actually are right. All our righteousness is like filthy rags, the Bible says. But see, we've been transformed. The Bible says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Come on. Ooh, we just went deep, didn't we? <laughs> Come on, prayer. Come on, this is a big deal. So here's what happens is Jesus shows up on the scene, the express image of the Father, perfectly revealing him. He said the Son, in John 5, 19, he said the Son can do nothing by himself. He only does what he sees his Father doing. Only does what he sees his Father doing. What's he saying? He's saying, I behold my Father, and then I do the same things. Right? That's it. You become what you behold. If you go to John chapter 14, this is one of my favorites. 
And I think I've preached more sermons out of this chapter than any other chapter of the Bible. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure. <laughs> John 14. Now, to put John 14 in context, it comes right after John 13. And uh, I say that for a reason. In John 13, Jesus starts what we call the final discourse. It's his last sermon for his disciples, and it begins with washing his disciples' feet, the Last Supper, that whole thing goes down. And he finishes out that chapter by saying, uh, hey, Peter, you're really going to mess up. And if you read the other gospel accounts, he really tells all his disciples, y'all are going to mess up. <laughs> right? And it's going to be bad. And Peter's like, no, no, not a chance. And he's like, yeah, yeah, even before the rooster crows tomorrow, three times you're going to mess up. You're going to deny me. You're going to disown me. He's like, what? No. And John 14 starts right on the heels of that warning. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Yay. So first he says, y'all are going to blow it. And then he says, don't worry. I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. Which is really good news. That means he's rooting for you. Even when he knows you're going to mess up. He expects you to make it in the end. Come on. He's definitely a forgiver. And then he says this thing about coming back to take you to be with me, to be where I am. And I grew up in an environment where I was taught that this is when Jesus comes back in the end and we're going to be caught up with him in the air and you know have this little mansion on a hilltop, hilltop and the whole thing, right? But as I study this word, I find out he wasn't talking about at the end. <laughs> eternal life starts now. Yes. He says in just a couple chapters later, this is eternal life that they may know you, the one true God of Jesus Christ who you said. When I read Ephesians chapter 2, it tells me that right now I'm seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. That's a big deal. <laughs> Come on. He has already taken us in himself to be with him where he is. And we'll see a little more of that in a little bit here. Come on. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you'll know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. What? Yeah. Hold up. Hold up. See, Jesus didn't walk around glowing like Moses, right? <laughs> Boom, exactly. He looks just like an ordinary person. And yet he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus was the express image of the Father, the radiance of his glory, right? An incredible, what's that? Yeah, but not a lot. Of, well, there was a lot of show, but without a, without a lot of pretense, maybe. I mean, there were miracles. There were amazing things that happened. But, you know, he didn't go around flaunting it. Sometimes he'd sneak people outside the village and heal them there and say, don't tell anybody. Right? He wasn't living there for the, here for the accolades. He had a mission. And he was on it. What I find fascinating about Jesus... The humility he lived with. But Philippians 2 says that our attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Who being in very nature God, did not consider his equality with God something to be grasped or held on to. The, uh, the 2011 version of the NIV says he did not consider his equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. But rather he humbled himself, taking the very nature of a servant and being found in human likeness, made himself obedient to death, even death on the cross. Yeah, that's a big deal right here. Just Jesus becomes like us. So that in John 5, 19, he can say the Son can do nothing by himself. What's that mean? You look that up in the Greek, it means nothing. Yeah. 
He's saying, I can't walk on water, I can't multiply food, I can't heal the sick or raise the dead. I have deliberately set all of that aside to show you what it looks like when a human being walks in right relationship with God, free from sin. And then you know what he did? He paid the price for you to live in a right relationship with God, free from sin. He was showing you what the Christian life looks like. First John 2 says, if uh, anyone who claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. How did he live? He can do nothing by himself. And so in John 15, 5, he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Look it up in the Greek. <laughs> nothing. I'm telling you, he invited us into the same lifestyle he was living. Not only that, but when you think about this whole thing about I'm the vine, you're the branches, this is, this is wild. Like, you are the branches of that vine, which I've never seen fruit grow out of a vine. The fruit grows out of the branches. And he says in John 15, I've chosen you and appointed you to go and bear much fruit. Which means Jesus, this is scary, he has chosen to limit his fruitfulness to your fruitfulness. What do I mean by that? Think about it right now. Jesus right now can snap his fingers appear to every lost person on the planet, preach the gospel to them, and do it better than you or me, right? <laughs> but he doesn't. Why? Because he wants to do it with you. He commissions his disciples and sends them out. And in Mark 16, it says, Then the Lord ascended into heaven, sat down at the right hand of the Father. The disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them, confirming the word by the signs that accompanied them. Even though they paid the price. Yeah. But he has called you with a purpose. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. But, the, but, but the apostles were persecuted. They were persecuted. Oh, of course they were. And it was that time. It was that time. Yeah. Jesus has promised persecution to us. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, as I told you, I've been in, around the world. I've been in some really hairy situations. Right. I've, Preach the gospel to gang members who have AK 47s and, uh, yeah, in Rio de Janeiro and uh, uh, slums of Port au Prince, Haiti, where the, this gang came in for their protection money and uh, some 68 year old woman talked me into going and preaching to them and ministering healing. And that. It's just, there's some crazy experiences. But, it, I told you I can't tell those stories. <laughs> but here's, here's the thing. The disciples left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they've been counted worthy of suffering for the name. And I haven't yet been counted worthy of suffering for the name. I mean, I've been made fun of. Maybe I'm worthy of that. Right? But I'm telling you, I, 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 I'm not here to say, look at me go. I'm like, mm, I got a ways to go. Because I haven't been beaten yet. Oh, dangerous positions, sure. But it hasn't cost me much. <laughs> Let's, let me stay on target here. I'm getting uh, rabbit trails. So John 14. Come on. Here we go. Verse 8. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. Now, i got a question for all you Bible scholars out there. The New Testament was written in what language? Aramaic. Some of it was maybe spoken in Aramaic, but it was written in Greek. Greek. Very good. And then uh, the Old Testament was written in what language? Hebrew. Hebrew. Right. Now there is a Greek version of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. And when you read Moses' words, show me your glory, in the, in the Septuagint, the language in the Greek, it parallels Philip saying in the Greek, show us the Father. And that will be enough for us. What's he saying? He's basically like, Lord, why go away and come back for us? Just show us the Father, we'll die. We'll go with you now. It'll be great. Why wait? Why leave us here waiting? We'll help you out. Come on. Show us the Father and that'll be enough for us. Philip knows, whether that was intentional on Philip's part, wording it that way or not, Philip did know the story of Moses and show me your glory and you'll die if you see me. Right? He knew what he was asking for. And Jesus' answer blows my mind. What does he say? Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time. Anyone who has seen me 
has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who's doing his work. Believe me when I say that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Now, pause there. Jesus is basically saying that the greatest revelation of God in the Old Testament pales in comparison to the one you've been walking with for the last three years. Whoa. That's a big deal. He's saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you encounter me, you've encountered the Father. Now, why didn't Jesus walk around with his face literally glowing? I don't know. Maybe it would have just been too much. But I do know this. At the Mount of Transfiguration, he showed up. I mean, one, one gospel account says that, that his, the, 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 his face changed and his clothes were white as lightning. Another one's like his face shone like the sun and his clothes were, were radiant. Mark's gospel's like his clothes were bleached whiter than anyone could ever bleach. <laughs> I mean, he's just... So in that moment, they saw the fullness of who he was. That was the transfiguration. You know, Romans 12 says, uh, Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The Greek word for transformed there is the same word used for the transfiguration. When you are transformed by the renewing of your mind, you are revealed for who you truly are. What do I mean by that? When you start to come into alignment with what God thinks about you, you start to believe this is who I am, you start to live it. It's a lot easier. It's easier to be the righteousness of God in Christ when you believe you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Come on. Much easier. As long as I think that I'm a sinful wretch, it's easy to be a sinful wretch. But real hard to be the righteousness of God in Christ. But if I consider myself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, things change. Come on. So he's like, don't you know me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? He's like, I'm in the Father, the Father's in me. If you don't believe what I'm saying, believe the miracles. And then he says, very truly I tell you, verse 12, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. And they'll do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Whoa. Now everybody wants to debate what Jesus meant when he said greater works. But I'd say, all right, let's start doing the same works first. Yeah. <laughs> and then we can debate greater. Yeah. Come on. The same works I've been doing and greater because I'm going to the Father. Now, I'm going to ask a question, but don't answer out loud because inevitably someone says something out loud that I'm not about to preach and then they feel bad. So just answer in your head. Why was Jesus saying that the reason he's going to the Father, or, or that the fact that he's going to the Father is the reason we will do greater works? I'll answer out loud. I was always taught it's because he was going to send the Holy Spirit. But then I realized something. That's not an advantage. Jesus had the Holy Spirit. So if Jesus going to the Father meant he sent us the Holy Spirit and that's how we'll do greater than Jesus, like, I, I don't see how that's an advantage over him. Now some who interpret it that way, they say it's greater in quantity because there are more of us to do more works, and I guess that makes sense because he was only doing works for like three years. But if it's greater in quality that he means, then we ought to expect to see greater quality works in the book of Acts and today. And guess what? You do. Because Peter's walking down the street in Acts chapter 5 and his shadow's healing people. I don't read anywhere that Jesus did that. I read about the hem of his garment, not his shadow. Acts 19, handkerchiefs and aprons that touched Paul's body were taken to the sick and the demons fled and the sicknesses were cured. I, I mean... I've read about when the clothes were still attached to Jesus, but not when a handkerchief is taken from him. Greater works than these. Today, I like, 
few years, uh, what was it, two years ago, two and a half years ago, uh, have you ever, anyone here ever heard of Reinhard Bonnke? Oh, yeah. yeah, he's this German missionary in Africa who has won millions, literally millions of people to Jesus. I think it's, uh, their count is around 80 million, something like that. And um, I went to his last crusade. Um, it, it, it was like his last at Reinhard Bonnke. And uh, what Reinhard Bonnke will do is he'll stand up on this stage in front of what appears to be an ocean of people. You can't even see the end of it. And uh, I have the joy and privilege of filming this, so it, it's, just, it's just an ocean, and you can't see the end. And, and he just preaches the gospel, and people are giving their lives to Jesus all over, and then he says, now we're going to pray for the sick. And he prays for the sick, and he says, blind eyes open and cripples walk, and the whole thing in Jesus' name. And all over the field, hundreds of thousands of miracles happen at once. And I don't read anywhere that Jesus did it like that. I read where laying his hands on each one, he healed them. But see, the, the, the issue here is, that doesn't make Reinhard Bonnke greater than Jesus. That doesn't make Peter or Paul greater than Jesus. What it does is it makes all of us fulfillments of Jesus' prophecy. That we will do greater things. And what it actually is, is it's him doing the works. So it's not technically us doing the works, it's him. It's shake and bake and I help. <laughs> like, I might have shook the little uh, Ziploc bag, but mom's the one who did all the work, right? I mean, that's what we're talking about. This, this kind of thing we've been invited into. And so Jesus says, if you don't believe what I'm saying about this union with the Father, believe the evidence of the miracles. And then he says, hey, you're going to do the same miracles. So let me ask you a question. This one you can't answer. If the miracles and the works Jesus did were evidence that he was one with the Father, and then he says, you'll do the same miracles, what's that mean about us? You're one with the Father. 1 Corinthians 6, I think it's verse 17, says, Whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Oh. So why was it that he said, Greater works than these will you do because I'm going to the Father? Let me tell you a little story of how the gospel works. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. Let me ask you Bible scholars a question. Did, Jesus, did Paul literally hang on a cross with Jesus? No. No. He, didn't even, he wasn't even around at that time. No. So what's he mean, I was crucified with Christ? What's he talking about? Yeah, exactly. See, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, I think it's verse 14, says, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. One died for all, and how many died? Oh. Surprise, you're dead. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, you're dead. And either you're dead in your sin, or you're dead in Christ. There's no other option. You're dead in this union with him, in this faith in him, or you're dead in independence. Yeah. See? Anything apart from him. And so what's that end up doing is, like, whichever one you choose, you share the same faith. The world and everything in it gets destroyed in the end. The kingdom of darkness gets thrown in the lake of fire. I don't want to be dead here. <laughs> but guess what? Jesus didn't stay dead. <laughs> Come on! Romans chapter 6, I think it starts in verse 5, it says that if we're united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. <laughs> Come on! That's really good news. Now, granted, interpretatively, he's likely talking in that moment about the future resurrection of the dead that is to come, that we look forward to. But right now, he says, he has placed his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. You've got a down payment of resurrection life from the moment you put your faith in Jesus. His spirit, the same spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, comes to live inside of you. You become a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. Woo! Oh. And then, then Ephesians chapter 2 says, when we were dead in our transgressions and sins, in the way we used to live, when we lived according to the patterns of this world, and the, under the power of the ruler, of the power of the year, the spirit who's now at work in those who are disobedient, which, by the way, I know I just rambled a lot, but, but guess what? 
Everybody's got a spirit at work in them. If you're living in disobedience, that's not the Holy Spirit. He's holy. Okay. When we lived in that way, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. It is by grace you've been saved. And it says, verse 6, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might clearly demonstrate the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You've been invited to sit on the throne with Jesus. Revelation 3.21, Jesus said to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Wow. What a circle. This is a big, big thing. Now, now catch this. Philippians 2. Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider his equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, humbled himself, took the very nature of a servant, all the way to death on a cross, and it says, Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. He gave him the name above every name. That the, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, and every tongue confess on heaven and on earth, and the of the earth, that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. Woo! The throne on which Jesus sits now is a throne of greater authority than he had when he walked this earth. It is post-resurrection authority. Do you see that? It was after he died and rose again that he came in Matthew 28 and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go make disciples. It was after he died and rose again that he appeared to John in Revelation and said, I hold the keys of death and the grave. The authority Jesus has now is greater than the authority he had. And we have been invited to sit with him on that throne, meaning we're invited to walk in greater authority than Jesus had when he walked this earth. And that is why you will do greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. It's about union with Him. When we live in this union with Jesus, He gets to reveal His present self, not His old self. 1 John 4, 17 says, As He is, so are we in this world. Not as He was, as He is. Come on. When you behold Him, things start to change. All right, let's bring this home. Come on. First Corinthians, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to rattle through a bunch of scriptures here, and I think it's all going to make sense. It's all going to come together. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 7. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory. Let's pause there. What is the ministry that brought death that was engraved in letters on stone? The law. I mean, that's not a very pleasant name for the law, <laughs> but that is the law. Specifically, the Ten Commandments was engraved in letters on stone. If that ministry came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading or transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? See, Moses was radiant, but Jesus was. His face shone like the sun. His clothes flashed like lightning. Moses didn't have that. Jesus came with greater glory. Verse 9. If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, the law, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? You realize the law brought condemnation. You didn't know you were doing wrong until the law showed up and said, that's wrong. But the, with the same veracity that the law brought condemnation, Jesus has brought righteousness. He says, you are now right. I've changed you. Verse 10, for what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory or fading came with glory, much greater is the glory of that which lasts. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We're not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. 
Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I want you to think about this for a second. It was the law engraved on tablets of stone. Elsewhere, Paul says, listen, the law was perfect and the command was perfect. So the problem's not with the law. The, law, the problem with the law was where it was written on tablets of stone. But God prophesies through Jeremiah that I'm going to take, or I'm, I'm going to write my laws on their hearts. Through Ezekiel, God says, I'm taking out the heart of stone and putting in a heart of flesh. Yeah. If you just behold the rules, the law written on tablets of stone, guess what? You get a heart of stone. You're dead because you can't live up to it. But when you behold Jesus, the, the Word made flesh, He takes out the heart of stone, puts in a heart of flesh. You become what you behold. You start to reveal Him in the world. Verse 18, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate, another version says, behold the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Do you see it? The more fully you behold Him, the more you become like Him, because you become what you behold. Romans 8, 29-30. This also links together this idea of the image and the glory of God. Romans 8, 29-30, it says, For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, and those He predestined, He also called, and those He called, He also justified, and those He justified, He also glorified. Notice it's past tense. Come on. 1 John 3, 2, this one's really important to me. 1 John 3, 2. Now, contextually, John here is talking about, in the end, who we're going to be after we have our resurrection bodies. And he says, uh, verse 2, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. The more clearly you can see Him, the more fully you're like Him. Until one day He shows up in His fullness, and when we see Him, instantaneously, we are in His fullness like Him. From, for right now, the more clearly we see Him, we are being conformed into His image from glory to glory. One degree of revealing Him to the next. The glory of God is a visual revelation of God, and we are incrementally becoming clearer and clearer revelations of God until the day comes when we see Him in His fullness and reveal Him in His fullness. Come on. In fact, if you look just a few verses later in verse 6, it says, No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. Why? <laughs> no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. According to John, the antidote to sin is seeing and knowing Jesus. Then aren't we all sinners? Ah, it's a good question. Aren't we all sinners? Well, let me put it this way. All throughout the New Testament, you see these statements about who we are now in Christ. I no longer live. I, I was a sinner. But that guy's dead. Christ lives in me. He's not a sinner, is he? No. So now I am, in Christ, the righteousness of God. Let me put it this way. If you uh, go to a factory that makes, okay, we'll, we'll wrap this up quickly. If you go to a, a factory that makes refrigerators, as soon as that unit comes off the line, we call it a refrigerator, right? Now, you don't call someone a painter unless they've painted, correct? You don't call someone a, a dancer unless they dance. But we call it a refrigerator before it has ever refrigerated anything. <laughs> Why do we do that? Exactly. All the parts are in place. All you've got to do is plug that thing into a wall and it's going to refrigerate. It's what it was made to be. Now, let's say you buy that refrigerator, you bring it home, you plug it into the wall, put all your food in it, you come back a couple hours later, open up the door, and everything inside is piping hot. You're going to be like, something's wrong. So you're on the phone with the manufacturer, like, send me the repairman, my refrigerator's not doing what it's supposed to do. 
But what if you slam that door shut and you see a little piece of masking tape on the door and someone took a Sharpie marker and wrote, oven? <laughs> now you're like, oh, my mistake. I thought I bought a refrigerator. Turns out it was an oven. Now it makes sense. I get it. But as soon as you peel that false label off of there, no, that's a refrigerator. That's not supposed to happen. So here's what happens. If we think of ourselves as I'm just a sinner, then when sin comes out of us, we say that's normal because that's the false label we believed. But as soon as you peel that thing off and you say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ, if sin comes out of me, I'm on the phone with the manufacturer. <laughs> Come on, Holy Spirit, I need a repairman, right? I need freedom. This is what we're called to, to walk in this union with Jesus. So what am I telling you? You're a refrigerator. <laughs> it is finished. You are, listen, today in this place, we've got people in a few positions. One, maybe you've never heard the gospel before, and what I just described about going from death to life, you're like, oh my goodness, I want that. Well, you're going to get to today. And the same Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead will live in you and make you a new creation. You'll be seated with Christ in the heavenly realms just like me. And it's awesome. People ask me how I know I'm going to heaven. I say, because I'm already there. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Now, maybe you're someone who, like, you've died to your old way of living. The Holy Spirit's raised you to new life, and you've been living this Christian life, but you had no idea that you were right now seated on the throne of Christ. I have good news for you. There's no prayer that gets you from here to there. You're already there. All you got to do is believe it. That's easy. So Jesus said these signs will accompany those who believe. It's normal for a believer to look like Jesus. Philip says, show us the Father. That will be enough. Jesus says, don't you know me? If you don't believe what I'm saying, believe the miracles. And then he says, you'll do the same things. That means when somebody says to you, if God would just reveal himself to me, then I'd believe in it. Your answer should be, don't you know me? Yeah. <laughs> After we've been hanging out all this time, don't you know that I'm in Christ and he's in me? Right. These aren't my words, they're in the Bible. If you don't believe what I'm saying, at least believe the miracles. Yeah. Come on. That's the union with God you've been invited into. To spend your life beholding him with the eyes of your heart. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians was, may the eyes of your heart be enlightened, that you may know the hope to which he has called you and the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. That's my prayer for you today. This is not something you can catch from a sermon. This is something that only happens as you spend time in his presence beholding him. Some of us, we come to church and we behold everything but him. Did you see what she wore? Did you see how he talked to his wife? Did you see that person coming at that time? Did you see? But if you become what you behold, when you're just focusing on everyone else's sin, guess what happens to you? Uh, any pastor will tell you, except your pastor, because this never happens in this church. But <laughs> any pastor will tell you that usually the most critical people in the church have the biggest problems themselves. Because they're just beholding all the sin in other people and reproducing it. What would happen if we started beholding Jesus in each other? What would happen if instead of being critical of, you know, whatever is going on, we instead said, Jesus, I want to see you in all of this. Come on. What would happen if somebody sang a wrong note and, and instead of Instead of being like, oh, that's so terrible. Instead, you're like, ah, oh, Jesus, look at the beauty of that heart that's worshiping you no matter what. Come on. <laughs> what would happen if when you're driving home or when you're at the restaurant after church, if instead of talking about all the things that you didn't like or the problems that you were observing, if instead you talked about, I saw Jesus in this person. I saw Jesus in this person. I'm telling you, that's the environment where the presence of God flourishes. And when I say presence, I mean what, what happened in, in, in Exodus 34, the face of God, 33. The face of God flourishes. His glory is revealed. If you've never given your life to Jesus, today's your day. 
And I don't, I mean, it's okay if you do this because, you know, whatever brings people into the kingdom. But me personally, I, I don't do every head bowed, every eye closed. I, I figure this is like, you know, this is not a shameful thing that needs to be between you, me, and Jesus. Like, this is something we as a family want to celebrate. So I say with every head up and everybody looking around. <laughs> In a second, I'll ask you to raise your hand. And, and all I'm really going to do, you can stay where you are. I'll stay here. You're safe. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to tackle you. You're, you can stay right there. You're, not <laughs> yeah, you're safe. But I'll, I'll stay here, and I'm going to pray for you. And I'm believing that day, that moment of death to life happens here today. Okay? So if that's you and you're saying, all right, I'm dead in my sin, I need to be born again, I need to be a new creation, born into Christ and, and living this life, if that's you, I want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand now? Is there anybody? Awesome. Anyone else? Yeah, anyone else? Good, good. Awesome. Anyone else? Jesus, I thank you for these four who responded to the gospel. Lord, you said no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. You said everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me, and whether they realized it or not, they were hearing your voice drawing their hearts. It wasn't about me preaching a good enough sermon. So Lord, I thank you for reaching out to them first, drawing them, and I thank you for their response to your voice. Right now I speak a blessing over their lives that from this day forward they will never be the same in Jesus' name. And right now I speak over each one of you in the name of Jesus, receive the Holy Spirit. You are forgiven. Your past is washed away because Jesus has taken it all. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, Jesus said there's a party in heaven. We've got to join the party. Yes. So welcome to the family. All right. You all ready for some miracles? Yes. All right. Here's all we got to do. Okay. I'm not the guy. <laughs> I'm just a guy. I'm an ordinary person just like the rest of you. Uh, some of you may be more extraordinary than me, but we're still in this together. Now, I've learned that the less I try, the more likely it is to happen. <laughs> because it's not about me and my effort, it's about Jesus and what he has accomplished once and for all. So I'm, are you ready to hear how to minister healing? I don't know. I haven't got a clue. You don't have to know how, you have to know who. And it's Jesus. So what I can teach you is how to minister. I can't teach you how to heal. But I can teach you how to minister in love. Okay? So I'm going to do that real quick in just a couple minutes. And then you are going to minister healing to each other. And miracles are going to happen. And it's not going to be because I lay hands on everybody. It's going to be because your church walks in this. Amen. Why? Because you've been beholding Jesus as I've been proclaiming who he is. And it's just easy. So here's the little quick crash course. I grew up in a church, Assemblies of God, just like this one. And the way I always saw healing ministry work was you put your hand on the person, just like the Bible says. You close your eyes really tight, because last time you closed them a little bit and it didn't work, so this time you got close them tight. <laughs> and you quote every scripture verse you know about healing, and you, uh, you know, Jesus, we know by your stripes we're healed, and you sent your word and healed our disease, and, and you, you do the whole thing. And, you know, at some point you're trying to push power out your arm, and <laughs> hand up, foot stomp, and speak in tongues for two and a half minutes. Give them a little shake so they know it's a holy prayer. You're laughing because you've either done it or it's been done. Anymore. And then you hope, you hope that later in the week they will magically feel better. Because it's certainly not going to happen right now. That was the culture in which I grew up. And maybe some of you have seen this same thing. It's very common in today's world. In 2009, I discovered something. It's not that complicated. In fact, all the complications are probably what's keeping it from happening. Because faith is when we do our part and only our part and completely trust Jesus to do the rest. Amen. But what we do is we do our part, you shall lay your hands on the sick and they shall recover, plus, because we don't believe that could possibly be enough. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't even say you have to say anything. 
You can, if the Spirit's leading you to, by all means. I mean, Jesus gave his disciples power and authority to drive out all demons and cure diseases. But I'm telling you, the more I complicate it with my own methods or, or troubleshooting or whatever, the less likely it is to happen. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't conform to the patterns of this world. One of the patterns of this world is if I try something and it doesn't work, I have to try harder. And so we keep adding little things to our method because the last time it didn't work and apparently I've got to try harder. This time I'm going to fast for three days before I lay hands on. It's not you. The pattern of the kingdom is not if you can't do it, try harder. The pattern of the kingdom is if you tried and it didn't work, try less, trust more. It's resting. It's simple faith. It's letting Jesus live through you. You do your part. They shall lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So let me show you what this looks like and then we're going to do it. Um, mm, Jesus, how do you want to do it? Ah, thank you, Lord. So I'm feeling um, something like right here in my shoulders. Is there anybody you've got a thing going on like uh, that's maybe restricting our movement or something? Something that's causing you pain? You? Okay. All right. Come here. Is that okay if I use you as an example? All right, cool. All right. So what's what's been going on with your arms? I was just like all of the fear just happened last week. Okay. I don't know. Okay, great, great. Um, so here's the thing. I don't have to close my eyes tight enough. I don't have to say the right words, feel the right feeling, think the right thought, do the right thing. None of that. It's all Jesus. So I minister healing with my eyes open and a smile on my face. Okay? And it can be quick. Right? Now, I haven't even said boo to her shoulder yet, okay? But I like to test things out as quickly as I can. So I like to even try just, just the default. What is, lay the hands on the sick and they'll recover. Now, be honest, not polite. You won't make me feel bad if nothing happened, okay? But I want you to test that arm out and see if there's any change. You don't feel anything now. Come on. Sometimes he spoke to the body part. He grabbed the new man's tongue and said a fast image, which means open. Sometimes he just told the person to do something that would otherwise be impossible. Get up, take your man, and walk. <laughs> right? right? It's just simple. But there was always some form of test it out. Now, some of you can't test it today. Like maybe you won't know until you go to your doctor or, or until you wake up in the morning or whatever. That's fine. All you got to do is have someone minister one time. It can take five seconds, and then you're done. That's all you got to do. And you'll test it later. And if you're healed, yay God. If you're not, have people minister again. Jesus, some of you, someone will minister to you and you'll feel a little better. Jesus ministered to a blind man, said, what do you see? The guy said, I see people like trees walking around. And then Jesus did not say, woo, partial healing. No, he put his hand back on the man's eyes and then his vision was fully restored. So perseverance is biblical, right? Some of you, someone will lay hands on you and nothing happens and as the minister, you're going to feel bad. Guess what? It happens to me all the time. It has happened to me in front of a congregation when I do something like this. It's okay. We're growing. We're all being conformed into his image. Not every person I lay hands on gets healed, but every person Jesus lays hands on gets healed. Amen. Okay? It's that simple. I'm still learning to be like him, and I don't have to feel bad about that. Yeah. You see? Yeah.
Um, how many of you, just by show of hands, you need healing of something, and it doesn't matter if it's cancer or a headache, Jesus paid the same price for all of it? Okay, great. Great day for a healing meeting. Okay, let's put our hands down. Um, what we're going to do in a moment, uh, if you've got kids, I want to set the children and workers free and have them not hate you. Yeah. So if you've got kids, in a moment, you can go out and get your kids, bring them in. Maybe some of them need healing, or if anything, they can help minister. I've seen children minister healing, and it's awesome. Yeah. And they don't need me to unteach all the stuff they've yeah. learned. They just come in, and they're like, oh, lay hands on people? Great. They'll help you. So bring them along with you. Uh, but here's what we'll do is those who need healing, um, all you got to do is raise your hand, and anybody else can come up to you. Don't, don't do it yet, or I'll get tired. They'll come up to you. As soon as someone gets to you, put your hand down. Okay? That way we know if we've got everybody. Now, if you go and get your kids, but you need healing, you come back, just find a couple people and jump in and be like, I'm joining you. I've got something. Okay? Sometimes you've got to be like the woman with the issue of blood and press through and say, I'm, I'm taking hold of this. I'm not going to wait for someone to come to me. But very simple. Let people come to you. Uh, or if no one's coming to you, you go to them. And we're just going to minister. And we'll keep it as quick and simple. Don't tell your whole medical history or we'll be here all day. It's yeah. time to end. <laughs> right? And some people want lunch at some point. So uh, minister one, two, three times. We're just going to take ten minutes and see how much God does. And then if you need, if you need, what's that? Yeah, you can use the restroom and come back. That's fine. And if you need more than ten minutes, if someone's willing to keep going with you for more than ten minutes, great. We're just going to close in prayer at that point. If someone's going to, um, uh, if you're like, okay, nothing happened, listen, I just church, taught your whole church how to persevere for this, so no worries. Cool? All right. So let's pray real quick, and then we'll, we'll have those who need healing raise their hands. Father, thank you for the miracles you're about to do. Thank you for the wild, crazy things that you're going to do in the name of Jesus. I pray that you would amaze us and that this wouldn't just be the day when all those miracles happen, but this would be the, 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 the launch pad of a culture. The Lord, all the people in this surrounding neighborhood that we're wanting to reach, that they would start to know this place as the place where people go to get healed. But even more importantly than that, Lord, I pray that every one of these people would be ones who behold you. So that when they're out on the street and they see someone in need, they lay hands on them there. And that's where the reputation comes from. You're part of that church in our neighborhood. You must be one of them. They're the ones who always pray for me. <laughs> God, let us be that kind of a people. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you need healing, raise your hand.